Thank you, Amber, for that um, <laughs> very nice introduction. Um, so my name is Mark Ward. Um, I work at Baylor Dallas, and we do a lot of management of upper GI leaks, which we'll get right into. Um, I'm a consultant for Boston Scientific, but I have no relevant um, disclosures. So leak management, when we're talking about the upper GI tract, we often deal with bariatric surgery. We do a lot of esophageal surgery with parasophageal hernia repairs, leaks related to that, fundiplications, esophagectomies is a, is a classic, um, as well as gastrectomies for gastric cancer, um, et cetera. Um, here are some of the leaks that we have had the privilege of uh, helping close. Um, you can see in the top is a sleeve leak with the lumen um, just off there to the right, um, gastric conduit necrosis from an esophagectomy, um, as well as an esophago jejunostomy leak. There are a lot of innovations, as everybody's talked about during this panel, um, and the question is, is it working? Um, you have the stents, obviously, endoluminal vac, which we can talk about a lot um, over the scope clips, um, internal drainage, which I'll get into a little bit more, um, as well as the variations of NG tubes, et cetera. Here is, for people who don't know endoluminal vacuum therapy, a um, just an animation of kind of how, uh, that don't work, hold on. Do they have to start this? Can you start that video for me? So here is a abscess cavity uh, in an esophagus or something. Um, first you take a look at uh, the abscess itself, take a look at everything in there. You come in and you usually take um, a bigger sponge and try to collapse that cavity under negative pressure therapy. Um, as we've talked about with EVAC and um, everybody who's mentioned it today, it is time consuming, but it does work. And I think the one thing that I would really stress to the audience today is the thing about EVAC is it actually creates almost immediate source control. Once you have that vacuum in there, the SERS response of the patient essentially goes away within the first 24 hours. It, it's pretty remarkable. And I know Sean was alluding earlier about worried about taking the drains on the outside. The truth is, is that those drains sometimes can uh, conflict with your EVAC therapy creating that, that pressure. And so by getting that pressure in there and collapsing that cavity, it really obtains source control almost immediately. Here's another uh, video. Can we play this as well? Um, for small leaks, EVAC therapy is extremely hard just because of what has been mentioned. You cannot get the sponge outside the cavity. Here is a video of one of those pinpoint leaks that you can see here. And in those cases, what we found is you still got to obtain source control. If you can't obtain source control by putting a vacuum therapy on there, we've uh, recently been able to do a lot of this endoscopic drainage in which we thread that wire, and we have an internal drain which does two things. One, it collapses the abscess cavity behind the leak, creating source control. Two, the actual stent itself, when they're that small, it, it actually plugs the hole. So I've gotten um, upper GIs and esophagrams after placing these stents, and no contrast leaks around these um, internal drains when you place them in such small holes. Usually I wait, honestly, about three to four days just to make sure everything uh, seals up and that surge response is gone. But it's really fascinating with those uh, pinpoint holes, uh, exactly how immediate they can also obtain source control. So the question now is, how do you decide? At our institution, we do a lot of endoscopic drainage. We do a lot of evac. But sometimes endoscopic um, therapies fail. Um, and we'll have to go to a fistula jejunostomy, which you can see from the picture is actually bringing up a loop of, in, of intestine to the leak site um, and creating uh, almost like a roux and Y through the fistula. That does two things. One is the stricture in the sleeve that often causes the leak up top. By doing a fistula jejunostomy, you actually allow some of that pressure to be diverted away from the leak, allowing it to heal. The other option as well is to do esophago jejunostomy, as you can see there in the far right. And the question is, how do you decide? We recently published, and this is sleeve leak data, but we published that once you hit that 90-day, 100-day mark of a chronic leak, the likelihood for surgery is dramatically higher. And so if you're within that 90 days or 100 days from when the leak was identified, 
You know, we can get sometimes transfers in, you know, 200 days out, and when it's that chronic, sometimes these endoscopic therapies are extremely difficult to manage. So there's a lot of pros and cons for this endoscopic leak management. The pros, I think, are definitely that it's less invasive. It avoids further surgery in a contaminated field. How many times in M&M have we all seen that, you know, an anastomosis resected and then we re it and it was a chronic infection and it just fell apart almost immediately. Um, it's a better quality of life in the long term. I think the last talk, especially with, you know, the 50% reduction or, you know, 50% of those uh, end colostomies, if you can maintain GI function throughout, you're going to have a much happier patient, even though the process might take a little bit longer on the front end. Um, and the, the one point I do want to make, especially with the internal drains and the EVAC therapy, is that it, it, it can provide immediate source control. So you have that unstable patient um, that maybe not is like so unstable you have to go to the OR immediately, but if they're like, you know, tachycardic, they're starting to get febrile, you have that white blood cell count, uh, it's not unreasonable if you have the experience to start with one of these therapies if you're comfortable with it because the amount of infection and source control it obtains is, is, is pretty drastic. The cons are that it's time consuming, and so we talked a lot about cost in one of our papers as well as time to proficiency, especially with using the EVAC. You know, when you have six, seven um, uh, exchanges, it can be time consuming, but I do think like we said in the pros, it can lead to a better quality of life in the, in the long term. The second is that often it can require repeated inventions, whether it's upper endoscopy, whether you need to add some drainage with an IR drain, you need to get repeated imaging, you send someone home with an internal drain, you're still getting CT scans on that person repeatedly to make sure that that cavity's collapsed before you're pulling that thing. Um, and then the, the, the real heart, kind of heartbreaker when you're doing some of this stuff is that you put out all this energy, all this time, and you still have to go to surgery anyways. Granted, I think it's a little bit easier when you have source control, it's not contaminated, but that being said, that's always like one of these kind of heartbreak moments when you're dealing with endoscopic leak management. And so I kind of wanted to shift gears a little bit to kind of what we were trying to, trying to re research and define is what if we could predict when people would succeed with this therapy and when people would ultimately need surgery anyways? So what we did is we did a, our own experience looking at 81 uh, foregut upper GI anastomotic leak patients, and 59 of them had endoscopic therapy success, whereas 22 had failures. This could be a combination of about, um, you know, failures from endoscopy, which honestly were probably closer to only about 10 to 12, and the other 10 were almost went to surgery immediately because we got them in such critical condition that we just had to do some kind of source control, you know, through an operation. Um, like I said, there was some crossover, but what we did is we looked at this database and we analyzed all the patient, patients treated with foregut leaks. We looked at all endpoints related to the leaks that were even caused by things um, that we're talking about today, time to leak diagnosis, time to first intervention, et cetera, as well as all of the endpoints used by the ACS risk calculator, hypertension, BMI, all that kind of stuff. And here's uh, kind of what, uh, just a descriptive summary of what we looked at, um, just with all the different variables. And what we were able to do is we were able to develop a nomogram to determine or to predict how successful you were gonna be with endoscopic therapy. Meaning, if you had certain factors, could you predict that this person is 95% likely going to heal with endoscopic therapy versus 75% versus 35% versus 15%, and then if it's only 15% likelihood, does that mean you try it initially to clean things up and then you go straight to surgery? That's kind of what we're trying to evaluate. And so given that we only had 81 patients in the entire cohort, statistically you can only get up to six endpoints that can be used for this nomogram anymore, and you're not gonna be able to statistically uh, guarantee that these are actually endpoints that would make or factor into this decision. The patient or the patient risk factors that were most likely out of all those factors that we analyzed were age, BMI, prior bariatric surgery, days to leak, and then days to first endoscopic therapy. Those were all significant on univariate analysis. When we looked at multivariate analysis, the, there was only four factors that actually really played the, the highest role, age, BMI, prior bariatric surgery, and the numbers of days to leak identification. And so using that, we were able to develop a point system. And when you're looking at this point system, it's a little confusing unless you kind of have this bar dividing the two. If you look at age, 
You know, if you're 15 years of age, your point, you have zero points. If you have BMI, the BMI is a little bit interesting because it's almost if you have, if you're too skinny or too overweight, those are actually uh, better, but the people in the middle, for some reason, um, did not correlate. Uh, but that being said, if you have a BMI of, let's say, 36, you have four points. Then if you have prior bariatric surgery, that's uh, you did not have prior bariatric surgery, you have two points. And then the number of days to a leak, if you got it on post-op day one, you have up to three points. And you combine all those points, and on those points correlate to the nomogram on the bottom on how successful or likely you are to succeed using some type of endoscopic therapy. And so I wanted to kind of validate, after we did this study, we were gonna validate with the next two sleeve leaks that we had, or not necessarily sleeve leaks, actually any upper GI leak that we had to see if it was um, predictive. And honestly, this is our ongoing uh, work at the moment. But the first one, so here's our nomogram on the right. The first one is a 64-year-old female, gastrectomy for gastric cancer, no prior bariatric surgery, 16 days from leak to intervention, and a BMI of 27. If you look at the calculation, her 64 years old gives her a age, uh, point value of seven. Her BMI gives her a, a value of 4.5. No bariatric surgery gives her a point value of two, and 2.5 gives you, uh, or 2.5 for leak recognition based on the 16 days. That combined is going to be uh, 16, did I do that right? Yeah, 16, which according to our nomogram, if you look at the bottom, 16 correlates with a 95% chance of doing endoscopic therapy. What happened with her? She healed. The next one that we got was a 57-year-old female with revisional bariatric surgery in Mexico. Um, she had a bypass and then returned for a revision for additional weight loss. There was 101 days from leaked identification, um, and her BMI was 18 due to malnourishment. Here's our nomogram to the right. When we calculate it, her age is 6. Her BMI is two because she had prior bariatric surgery. She actually gets a zero and one for leak identification. She has about a 50% chance of healing this. And um, unfortunately, she had failed and actually needed an, an EJ. But those are some of the things that we're looking for to help all of us understand when is endoscopic therapy appropriate? How long should we go to? Because like we talked about earlier, whether it's EVAC, EID, self-expanding stents, it's such a heartbreaker you spend all this time and energy and then you have to go to surgery anyways. So in conclusion, we're in our validation phase of that nomogram. Um, that it has checked out on recent patients. Uh, all these um, endoscopic procedures can present, prevent unnecessary surgeries, et cetera. It can prevent unnecessary prolonged hospital admissions if the nomogram works out, and then we know who's going to succeed with endoscopic therapy and who won't. Uh, the future, as the number of leaks is, are managed, we can expand on these endpoints, and hopefully we can better characterize patients who need more aggressive surgical intervention versus who we can wait on for more endoscopic management. I'm happy to take any questions.